this promises to be a very interesting and challenging event. Welcome to Peter's story, whom we have dreamed about having here for several years now, so thank you very much for coming. Others will introduce Peter's story, but I would like to introduce the event. Several years ago, Andrew Young was speaking on nonviolent active resistance. And someone in the audience after he spoke stood and asked this question. Mr. Young, do you really think that nonviolent active resistance is an alternative or a preventative to war? His answer was short and simple. No one has ever tried it. <laughs> and then he went on to say that, in fact, we have a lot of evidence that war is not a preventative of war, <laughs> and that war does not prevent other wars, so why don't we try active nonviolent resistance? A few years later, three years ago to be exact, <coughs> uh, Reverend James Lawson was here as a Lowell lecturer for a series of fall events, and during that time he was here, he was asked this question. Reverend Lawson, what, was, what is missing in the stories we have of the civil rights movement? And his response was, there's quite a lot missing. It's told as if the civil rights movement had only to do with the civil rights laws. And in fact, the, civil, the passage of the civil rights law would have had no effect whatsoever had there not been action at the same time with several other programs that initiated social change. And then he added this, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. did not see himself as a civil rights activist <coughs> in isolation. He saw himself as advocating for the redemption of Western civilization. And until we see the redemption of, civil, of Western civilization, the work of Martin Luther King Jr. has not been done. These are two stories of people who dare to think something bold and to offer the challenge and dare to do. Tonight is a night when we are invited to dare to think boldly and dare to do. Thanks to Peter's story. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Mary Elizabeth. It is my uh, privilege to introduce Peter's story to, to my community, the community that I'm very fond of. Uh, it's called the School of Prophets, Peter. And Peter is a prophet pastor in our day. I uh, feel very privileged and gifted that I've been part of Peter's orbit and enjoyed his friendship. I, um, there's so much that can be said about you, Peter. I think the main thing to say about you, and I think this is fair, that you're primarily a pastor. He was also president, presiding bishop of the, of the Methodist Church of Southern Africa, and the presiding uh, and the bishop and the president of the South African Council of Churches during the times when opposition to apartheid uh, was <coughs> He has a, um, served for two years as chaplain to the prisoners on Robben Island, including Nelson Mandela. And he created in South Africa the Methodist Order of Peacemakers. And Peter and I have had a dream of doing that here in this country. At least we've talked about it. And I haven't given up on it, Peter. I think it's still a possibility. After his retirement as bishop, he came to Duke Divinity School, uh, where he taught for many years. He was the Williams Distinguished Professor Emeritus of the Practice of Christian Ministry. And since 2006, he has worked to, a, to design, to fund, and to build a seminary, a Methodist seminary, in South Africa, uh, which opened its doors in 2010. Uh, this weekend, I reread Peter's, story, uh, Peter's sermons in a book called With God in the Crucible, Preaching Costly Discipleship. 
I commend these sermons to you. But to get at the heart and the spirit and the soul of this man, I thought it would be good to go beyond the titles to talk about some of the images that he raises in these sermons. As a young pastor, uh, Peter was in District 6 in Cape Town, which was, as he describes it, a very colorful community, the, the, the residence, residential area of Cape Town that was integrated. In 1966, the regime decided to make this District 6 a white group area, effectively sentencing its 30,000 inhabitants to be removed, excluded uh, from the area uh, by force. In 1971, his congregation put a plaque on the wall of their church, and this plaque faced the police station directly across the street. And it said, all who pass by remember with shame the many thousands of people who lived for generations in District 6 and other parts of this city and were forced by law to leave their homes because of the color of their skins. Father, forgive us. This was South Africa's first public memorial to the horrors of apartheid. Peter was a senior pastor of the Central Methodist Mission in the heart of Johannesburg from 1976 to 1989, the premier Methodist pulpit in South Africa. For in his forward to the sermons, Bishop Tutu talks about Peter's courage in integrating this church in the process losing about 2,200 parishioners. But as he said, in doing that, we created a, a, a church that could truly deal with, with apartheid and the political realities of South Africa. When the security police defaced this church in 1988 with crude political graffiti, Peter wrote a sermon entitled, Sentence them to the church. Now, isn't that a great title? <laughs> Sentence them to the church. What a great way to deal with this. To sing with us, to pray with us, to pass the peace of Christ with us, to hear the liberating good news of God's grace with us, to break bread with us, so they may find God. He was also, as president of the South African Council of Churches, the person who showed up in the early morning hours of 1988 to view the, the uh, destruction of the headquarters after a bomb was planted in the parking garage. He, he talks about being confronted by a scene from hell. The street littered with glass and masonry and twisted steel. Gaping window frames with shredded blinds fluttering like the tattered banners of a sacked fortress. The fires were still burning in the basement and where our foyer used to be, a yawning crater. Amazingly, he adds, the Christ figure still hung on the forest rear wall, rear wall. With the front of the building gone, it was exposed now to the street, arms outstretched over this ruination. My favorite story about Peter is found in an essay he wrote in this book, Conflict and Communion, Reconciliation and Restorative Justice at Christ's Table. And I'm going to use his words. Some of the most powerful moments in my life have been a communion in places where people have been divided from one another. I once received a phone call in the early hours of the morning telling me that one of my black clergy in a very racist town, 60 miles from Johannesburg, had been arrested by the secret police. I got up and drove out there, picked up another minister, and then went looking for him. When we found the prison where he was and demanded to see him, we were accompanied by a large white Afrikaner guard <coughs> to a little room where we found Ike Molabi, close Peter, sitting on a bench wearing a sweatsuit and looking quite terrified. He had been pulled out of bed in the small hours of a freezing winter morning and dragged off like that. I said to the guard, we're going to have communion. And I took out of my pocket a little chalice a tiny little bottle of communion wine and some bread. 
I spread my pocket handkerchief on the bench between us and made the table ready. And we began the liturgy. When it was time to give the invitation, I said to the guard, the table is open to all. So if you'd like to share with us, please feel free to do so. This must have touched some place in his religious self because he took the line of least resistance and nodded rather curtly. I consecrated the bread and the wine and noticed that Ike was beginning to come to life a little. He could see what was happening here. Then I handed the bread and the cup to Ike because one always gives a sacrament first to the least of Christ's brothers or sisters, the ones that are hurting the most, and Ike ate and drank. Next must surely be the stranger in your midst. So I offered bread and the cup to the guard. You don't need to know too much about South Africa to understand what white African racists felt about letting their lips touch a cup from which a black person had just drank. The guard was in crisis. He would either have to overcome his prejudice or refuse the means of grace. After a long pause, he took the cup and sipped from it. And for the first time, I saw a glimmer of a smile on Ike's face. Then I took something of a liberty with the truth and said, in the Methodist liturgy, we always hold hands when we say the grace. <laughs> <laughs> and very stiffly, the guard reached out his hand and took Ike's. And there we were, a little circle, holding hands while I said the ancient words of benediction, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Now, in regard to uh, Peter's topic tonight, he was asked by Nelson Mandela to help form the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, naming people to it, uh, including his good friend who was the General Secretary of the, of the uh, South African Council of Churches, Bishop Edmund Tutu. From my perspective, um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was a major step forward in our civilized world in dealing with transitional justice. It's not perfect. There are a lot of things that uh, were not perfect about it. But it was critical in the life of South Africa, and it was generative in the world. Peter, we look forward to your thoughts tonight on the truth and reconciliation in South Africa. A bridge too far? Did the TRC fail South Africa? Or did South Africa fail the Truth Commission? Thank you very much, Tom, and good evening, everybody, and thank you, uh, Dean Mary Elizabeth, and thank you, Professor Tom, for the invitation to be here tonight. It's my second visit to the Boston School of Theology, and I feel privileged to be among you. The last time I want to warn you that the last time I came here, I stole uh, a clergy person. I taught in a class where a young lady came to me afterwards and asked if I knew her father. And she mentioned her name and I said, yes, he and I were at seminary together, but he left for overseas and uh, I lost contact with him. She said, well, we came here. I was a little girl and we came here to America. My dad now is at the University of Virginia. And she said, I've never ever felt right about leaving South Africa and I wonder if there's a chance to come back and visit. And I said, you'd be very welcome. And today she's a minister in the Methodist Church of Southern Africa. <laughs> now, we got the best of both worlds. We got a, a Boston School of Theology trained minister, and we got her back to South Africa. So I, I'm just warning you, Dean, that you might lose a student or two. <laughs> Thank you for, for the welcome. And so this evening, looking back now, uh, 20 years of democracy in South Africa. It's hard to believe that freedom came to my country uh, in 1994, just under 20 years ago. And of course, one of the milestone uh, events and processes around that uh, transition was uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, I need to declare my interest and say right away that I am an absolutely unashamed 
advocate of the TRC process, utterly uh, committed to sharing the news about that process. But at the same time, we need to ask questions as we look back uh, 20 years later, because I can recapture some of the feelings that were in my heart around that time. They were amazing feelings. Uh, perhaps euphoria is uh, an accurate description. Some might feel that it was an unrealistic euphoria, but I uh, am so grateful we passed through that period. However, we are not there anymore. Our country is in some serious trouble. And, uh, and so this is perhaps an appropriate time for us to ask this very question. I am asked wherever I go, do you think the TRC has failed? And so I think we do need to address this question tonight. Now, first of all, let's have some, uh, some background. Let me remind you, because I think it's very easy for people from a distance to oversimplify the truth and reconciliation process. It was an extremely extremely uh, delicately put together uh, process and uh, I think an amazing design. It began with this question. It began with a question being asked before 1994, before the change came, how, when we become free, shall we deal with our past? And there were three positions taken broadly. The first one was, well, what we need to do is we need to prosecute and punish. And the Nuremberg, I guess, model was held up as the way in which you should deal with the, the people who were responsible for one of the most evil systems in human history. Uh, it was perfectly justified for people to suggest that there needs to be retribution. People need to pay for what they've done to us. The question, however, was if we go the way of prosecution, first of all, who do we prosecute? Do we prosecute the generals? Do we prosecute the colonels? Um, do we prosecute the junior officers? Uh, do, we, do we prosecute the, the presidents of the racist regime? What about the members of parliament who dominated uh, parliament for so many years and passed the laws which destroyed so many lives? Ultimately, the question comes down to what do you do about the little gray man in the little gray suit who was a bureaucrat in an office somewhere who destroyed people's lives by sending them away uh, from the city because of their race or refusing them marriage because of the color of their skin or whatever. The other question was, how much, how much energy and resources do we have as a country, exhausted by a long struggle for liberation, left virtually bankrupt, which not many people know, by the white regime that is now about to hand over? What kind of energy have we got to spend for the rest of the century and beyond uh, in chasing down, amassing evidence, prosecuting the perpetrators of the wrongs in our country. Do we really want to spend the next 50 years as some Israelis have, hunting down the last doddering geriatric Nazi in order to wreak retribution? And so there are problems about prosecuting. And in any case, will we find the evidence? Or will we spend years in court cases which end up with hung juries? Well, there was another option, of course, and that is to forgive and forget. And you can guess who were the major advocates of this. Uh, I can remember President de Klerk saying why don't we just take hands and forgive and forget and move forward? The question is, of course, whether anybody has the right to tell a victim that they must forgive.
who, who can dare to tell somebody who has lost a child to torture in some secret cell somewhere, well, you should forgive, because that's what the Bible says. You should forgive. And so it's not for us, in fact, to tell other people whether or not they can forgive. And how dare we suggest, how dare we suggest that we forget when forgetting is sentencing ourselves to the repeat of our history in the future. So forgiving and forgetting was not really an option. And fortunately, there were others who who asked, I think, the most important question. Is it possible to both remember and forgive? Can, can we as human beings do that? Are we capable of that? And it was people like that who began to hold workshops, who began to research what was happening in other countries, especially in Central and Latin America, where there had been some forms of truth commissions. Uh, and we began to ask, what would, what would a truth commission look like in, um, in South Africa? These were people largely from the legal world. These were people largely from the faith communities. These were people largely from the world of the healing professions, uh, counseling and, 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 and trauma counseling and, and so on. And I was part of a, a number of those exercises. And I became more and more excited by the possibilities that there were uh, lying ahead of us if we could manage to go this way. And the beautiful thing was that there were people in the African National Congress at that moment out of the underground who had now surfaced or come back from exile who, who could hear exactly what this could perhaps achieve. Uh, and in particular was the new Minister of Justice, who was a Muslim himself, who was a very humble man, himself had suffered detention without trial, he had suffered torture. And his approach was to the faith communities. And he said, you know, you people are the ones who have the right words and language. I'm a lawyer, he says. We're in the business of prosecuting and punishing. Uh, he said, you're the people who, who, who talk about forgiveness, you talk about reconciliation, you talk about confession. <clears throat> this is your language, your world. Tell us how to do this. And so there emerged these slogans. First of all, without truth, no healing. <coughs> we were clear <coughs> that there could be no sweeping under the carpet. We had to face the truth of what we had done to one another, and we had to face it squarely. And we had to work out a process where that facing of the truth uh, could become a reality. Because without surfacing the truth, our deeds would be buried and would lie like toxic waste under the soil, but coming slowly ever so often up to the surface and polluting the future of our country. We had to deal with the truth. There would be no healing without it. But also, without forgiveness, there would be no future. If we sentenced ourselves to years of blame and resentment and revenge and retribution, then the chance of building a new future in a very fragile country would, uh, would be failed. And so the birth of the TRC started where the interim constitution, agreed by the two warring parties who sat down together, there was just one phrase in the agreement. And this phrase uh, was all we had to work with. There shall be provision for amnesty. That's all there was. No detail whatever. And of course, for people who had been part of the regime, the <coughs> perpetrators, they assumed that that was it. That was a forgive and forget phrase. <coughs> but there were others who were determined to take that phrase and, and turn it into something substantial and significant. 
And so using that phrase, there shall be provision for amnesty, the debate started. It would not have progressed too far had they not <coughs> developed an ethos and a climate in which people began to think of the possibilities of reconciliation. And I want to suggest that one of the significant milestones in achieving that was in 1991, where just as the announcement took place of the release of Mandela and the uh, sitting down with the liberation movements and so on, the churches decided that if they were to be of any use in the healing of South Africa, then the churches had to be themselves healed in their relationships. Now, there were three distinct groups in uh, the Christian family in Southern Africa. And if I focus primarily on churches tonight, it's because the vast majority of South Africans uh, are Christians and belong to, to churches. There are other faith communities, of course, there, but very, very small. You had, first of all, you had the Dutch Reformed churches who had provided the theological and ideological uh, support for the apartheid ideology throughout the years. The Dutch Reformed churches were the apartheid regime at prayer. And so deeply were they enmeshed with that regime that you will recall, many of you, that they were declared to be in heresy by the World Alliance of Reformed Churches. Certainly my own Methodist church passed resolutions preventing us from having relationships with Dutch Reformed clergy in the towns and villages where our clergy were appointed. Uh, that's how deep and wide the chasm became. Then you had the sort of conservative evangelical and Pentecostal churches who, in a sense, might as well have been on Mars because they went ahead with the preaching of the gospel and the reaching out in evangelism and things like that without too much concern for what was happening around about them in terms of human rights and human rights violations. <coughs> in fact, I used to say to my Pentecostal friends, you're the only people I know who can <coughs> bury your heads in the sand and wave your hands in the air at one and the same time. <laughs> And then the third group of churches were those who were allied to the South African Council of Churches, uh, where the best known general secretary of that period was uh, Desmond Tutu. And uh, this was the body that became the, uh, the, the point of the spear in the resistance to apartheid. And these were the Catholic, Methodist, Anglican, Presbyterian, Congregational, Lutheran, and one or two other church groups, the Quakers played a very significant <coughs> role in the SACC. Now these bodies were very different. And these bodies had been separated from one another by the struggle for liberation. And we felt the time had come where if the nation was to be healed, the churches need to heal their relationships first. And so this conference at a place called Rustenburg was called in order to try and deal with that. And I recall very, very clearly the, uh, our, our arrival there, I can remember standing with a group of my colleagues and looking over at the Dutch Reform Ministers and recognizing this will be the first time I've talked to Dutch Reform Ministers for 20 years. And I wasn't looking forward to it, frankly. Uh, these were collaborators. And then, of course, as you probably know, our first session began, and we were all pretty uneasy and stiff and formal, and then at some point, uh, a Dutch Reformed professor from Stellenbosch University asked permission to speak, a Professor Jonker, his name was, and he came forward, and he began to speak, and he offered a most profound and deep and clearly, utterly sincere apology not only on his own behalf, but vicariously, he said, on behalf of my church and my people for the hurt that we have, we have done. 
in the name of a pastor. <coughs> and as this confession, not emotional, just very quiet, just confession just kind of <coughs> fell amongst us. I can remember in the row I was sitting in hearing the words, what the hell do we do with that? <laughs> and then a little black priest bounced onto the stage by the name of Desmond Tutu and said, well, I don't know about the rest of you, but my theology tells me that uh, when somebody confesses sin, I have to offer forgiveness. That, that, that started a process in that conference where the Pentecostals then came forward and said, we slept through a revolution. We were so busy saving souls, we, weren't, we were blind to, to what was happening in our country. And that, that left the good guys, of course, uh, you know. And we had asked the question, uh, maybe there are things we need to confess as well. And of course there were. We belonged to churches which were full of great liberal statements, but harbored racism within us. Uh, we, we were good at talking the talk, but not often walking the walk and so on. And that led to the Rustenburg Confession, which, uh, and, and I can remember, I chaired the, the body that wrote that document. Uh, and it included confessions from all corners of the church. And I remember sitting up very late into the hours of the morning, wording this document with, Professor Johann Haynes, head of the Dutch Reformed Church. And I remember that it was not long afterwards that he was killed by an assassin's bullet, largely because of his role in leading the Dutch Reformed Church towards repentance. A new atmosphere was established because now we had the churches together and we had, we had church bodies that could reach to each of the political... We could deal with Mandela if he gave us trouble. The, uh, the Dutch Reformed Church could talk to de Klerk if he gave trouble. And the Pentecostals had a wonderful relationship with Budalesi, who was a very troublous person indeed. <laughs> so the National Peace Accord then emerged out of that, which made possible a peaceful and free and fair election in 1994. And the National Peace Accord needs lots of study because I believe it is as miraculous and as important a process as the Truth and Reconciliation. The TRC was, but we, we don't have time to go into that tonight. And so on July the 27th in 1995, Parliament passes the Promotion of National, National Unity and Reconciliation Act, setting up the potential for the Truth Commission. <coughs> These are the purposes, to establish as complete a picture as possible of the nature, causes, and extent of gross violations of human rights committed between 1960 and 1993. Arbitrary dates chosen as perhaps the span of years in which the worst of the apartheid atrocities <coughs> took place. Establish the fate of the victims of apartheid. As the Truth Commission went forward, it became absolutely evident that what the worst form of suffering of all, perhaps, was not to know what happened to my husband, my daughter, my son, my, my cousin. To afford victims the opportunity to relate their stories in public, it became clear also that when you tell a story to people who are listening, it changes life for you. To recommend reparations, to grant amnesty where appropriate. And so the Truth Commission was born. It consisted of the Chair, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, the Vice Chair, Dr. Alex Borain, ex-Presiding Bishop of the Methodist Church, uh, who had moved into, uh, into politics, uh, and then a, a number of persons who were chosen uh, on the grounds of being nominated by any South African had the right to nominate a truth commissioner 
uh, Mr. Mandela set up a panel of people to select the truth commissioners. Uh, as Tom said, I was a member of, of that panel. It was rather cleverly set up. I'm not sure whether deliberately or not. I think it was by accident. But of course, every political, major political party demanded to be on that panel. And then very shrewdly, Mr. Mandela invited a trade unionist, somebody from Lawyers for Human Rights, and two church leaders to sit on that panel as well. And what happened, of course, is that the politicians each came with a slate of names. These people you will not allow to be truth commissioners. These people we want. And then we just let them fight with each other, and they just blocked each other and neutralized each other which made it possible to then suggest names which the second best, if they couldn't get their slate, then the next best thing was to get somebody who might treat them fairly. <laughs> and so that was when we were able to, to introduce the names of people of high caliber, mm. people who were not committed to a particular political party, mm. people who were not ideologically bound, people who could be not neutral, but what's the other word? Party. Impartial. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody could be neutral in South Africa, but there are people who can be impartial. And so that's how it emerged. When we took the list to the old man, he looked at it and he said, Well, Peter, let's look at the women first. Have we got enough women? And he seemed satisfied that we had enough women. And uh, the women did some really shrewd work, I want to tell you, on that selection committee. And. Um, and then he wanted to look at whether the distribution was right. And uh, at the end of the day, we, we submitted 24 names, and he chose about 18 of them. And then the commission was set up with three committees. <coughs> the one on the left was the Gross Human Rights Violation Committee, chaired by Desmond Tutu. And that was to hear the stories of the victims. And there were 20,000 such stories which passed through the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Then there was the Amnesty Committee, who would hear disclosures from perpetrators seeking amnesty, and we'll talk about that a little more. And there were, this was interesting, this was interesting, because we had a deadline, and we knew that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission would stand or fall by whether the perpetrators would come forward. We knew victims would come forward. But what about the bad guys? Some date in May was the cutoff date. And we had about 25 names until the middle of May. And we were getting very worried because some of the generals were working very hard to say to their people, just, just lie low, keep quiet. You know, if you lie low, they can't force you to do this. Uh, but by that time, the victims' hearings were in, in solid sweep. And in the victims' hearings, the names of certain people were coming up all the time as torturers and perpetrators. And so these people began to be in crisis. And then the ranks began to break. And by deadline date, 7,000 perpetrators had come forward seeking amnesty. And then the Reparation and Rehabilitation Committee it was to have the tough job of working out how do, you, how do you respond to the pain of vast numbers of people. There were important support units here set up officially, witness protection, legal services, investigation, research, etc. But I guess the most important was in fact in blue on the left. Kulumani is a word which means speak out. And what we discovered very early is that victims needed support in order to speak out. They needed somebody to give them the courage and the nerve to do so. When you have suffered torture in a police station in a small village at the hands of the sergeant in charge, and ten years later you're invited to come and tell the story, but the same sergeant is still in charge of that police station down the road, you need courage. And so Kulamani groups were set up to encourage in that way. <coughs> the modus operation, to operate for a maximum of two years, to hold open and transparent hearings all over the country, broadcast on radio all day to the nation, and on television every evening. 
to begin with the victims' hearings, encouraging victims of all sides to come forward, giving them the dignity of being heard and acknowledged, their suffering recognized and reverenced. It's amazing how the media obsesses with bad guys. And we realize that if the perpetrators were to, if their hearings were to be held simultaneously, they would get the headlines. So the perpetrators were told, for six months we're not interested in you. It's victims only who will get pride of place. And it worked. To conduct hearings and make recommendations on reparations. To conduct amnesty hearings. Now, for a lot of people in the United States, their idea of the Truth Commission was a place where bad people could go and get, get off scot-free if they just admitted to what they did. It's not as simple as that. If you were to receive amnesty, you needed to meet a number of criteria. First, you had to take personal responsibility for the violation, for the atrocity. Don't blame anybody else. Secondly, you had to make full disclosure. If you tortured so many people or assassinated so many people, don't tell us just about three of them. Thirdly, you had to show that you had a political motive and that you were part of a political formation in the, uh, in the, in, in the acts that you perpetrated. And finally, which is something that judges are better than me working out, you had to show proportionality. You had to show that your horrible action had some relationship to reality at that time. And I always explain it this way. If there are three young black youngsters in the township who are handing out leaflets, calling upon people to resist the government, and they are taken away and assassinated, nobody can argue proportionality by the security police. If, on the other hand, they were carrying submachine guns and they were taken away and the same treatment was meted out, you could argue some form of proportionality, and that was for the chair of the uh, amnesty committee to work out, and that was a judge uh, trained to do that. If amnesty was granted, then no criminal or civil liability would uh, ever could be held against that person. If not, then the evidence that person brought to the TRC could not be used in a court of law. In other words, if amnesty is not granted, then the Attorney General would have to begin an investigation and would have to produce independent evidence separate than the evidence that the perpetrator brought to the commission. And then there was a witness protection program, very important at the time, and an investigative unit. What was unique about the Truth Commission? First of all, it was nominated by the public. So the people had an investment. We had some 600 names before us when we started our selection. We had hearings around the country, uh, and uh, they were sometimes very robust indeed, because you'd be surprised some of the people who thought they could sit on the Truth Commission after what they'd done in South Africa. Uh, in fact, I said at one point, uh, finding previous supporters of apartheid is like looking for hen's teeth. Yeah. It's like looking for Nazis after the Second World War. They seem to have all vanished all of a sudden. Some of them tried to get on the Truth Commission. The priority given to victims was very, very important. One almost sensed the uh, new dignity that came amongst these people. Nelson Mandela at one point threw a party when he moved into the State House in Pretoria for uh, veterans of the anti-apartheid struggle. And uh, we went along to this, this party and this was the place where the white leadership of the country used to live. And there was a nine-hole golf course laid out in the grounds of the State House in Pretoria. And as we drove in, I said to Elizabeth, isn't this marvelous? As you saw these dusty buses from all over South Africa sort of parking on the greens of this nine-hole golf course, churning up the grass. And out of these buses poured humble people from all over South Africa, simple people, going back years who had played a role 
who had suffered in the struggle. It was an amazing time. And we gathered for this meal, and Nelson Mandela spoke, and it was, it was, he greeted, he said, I want to greet my heroes. I said, you know, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. And you could just feel the pride of these very simple, but sometimes illiterate people. And then he said, I've brought you here so that you can see where the evil deeds of the past were planned and plotted. And you could hear a kind of growl <laughs> through, the, through the, the audience of about you know, 500 people. And he said, but I've also brought you here so that by your noble spirits, this place can be cleansed. And you could feel people swell with a sense of dignity. Well, that's, that's what the hope was for the victims who would come and very painfully tell their stories. The hearings were public. Provision was made for hearings in camera, but it was only used once, and wrongly, I believe, uh, for uh, Winnie Mandela for a brief part of her hearing. It was very transparent. The commission went to the people. They didn't go to the commission. Nobody had to go to some big palace of justice and be intimidated. The commission came to dusty halls in townships around the country. The commission sat low and invited people to sit on the same level with it. And this was all a very beautiful symbol of what the commission was trying to convey. Victims of both sides were invited. For the first time in a struggle, not just the victorious side and the victims of the bad guys were invited, but the victims of the good guys were invited too. And so there were white people who came and gave evidence of the, the, the loss, perhaps because of a bomb planted by a, 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 a liberation movement guerrilla. And the perpetrators of both sides were invited to come forward and seek amnesty. This was a bit hard for the ANC to swallow, and they tried their very best to block this, and we refused them. And we said it doesn't matter how noble, how noble your cause was, some of the things that were done in the name of that noble cause were disgraceful, and you must be held accountable for them. That has never happened before in history. What we were saying was that a gross human rights violation is a gross human right, right, rights violation. And uh, you can't say that one is more moral or immoral than the other because it is committed for justice or injustice. So regardless of the justice or injustice of the cause you promote it, it's, a, it's an immoral act. The last, and I think very, very important element of the Truth Commission was the spiritual and theological dimension. I want to say I am convinced that had Desmond Tutu not been the chair of this Truth Commission, it would have collapsed in three months. The stresses and strains in that commission, the searchlight of attention on it, the attempts to uh, sabotage it, uh, the fear of it, all of these things would not have held together. Uh, they would have done for the Truth Commission had it not been for the spiritual stature, not only of Tutu, but of a number of Truth Commissions who I didn't bother to, deep, to, to name personally, all of whom had remarkable spiritual maturity and depth. And while there was always throughout the TRC uh, uh, people who who argue that it, it should not be so religious. Why is it opening with prayer? We're a secular country. Uh, why is Tutu wearing his, his bishop's robes? They were missing the point completely. Uh, South Africa is a secular country, but South Africans are not secular people. And in every hearing, asked or unasked, the people began to sing hymns. Whenever a victim paused to weep, the people began to sing. Mm -hmm. They began to pray. They prayed people through. There was no question about it. 
the secularists lost that battle altogether, in my view. And the TRC would have collapsed if the secularists had had their day. If a judge, instead of somebody of the caliber of Tutu, had, had chaired it. Well, here are some significant numbers. 21,000 victim statements, 38,000 allegations made of human rights violations, 10,000 killings recorded. And here, of course, is where we have to pause. That while the moral parity argument, we stood by it. There was no question about which side had committed by far, by far, by far, the majority of the human rights violations. 86% of the victims who came forward were African. 1.1% were white, and the others belonged to other population groups. So the white population got off scot-free during that struggle virtually, and uh, that came out very clearly. 7,000 perpetrators, 2,000 acts of torture, in 200 torture venues around the country recorded. And that's just between 78 and 89. It is Hannah Arendt who says forgiveness, about forgiveness that full justice is impossible unless there is something beyond punishment. There is very little hope for the restoration and healing of societies which have been deeply divided and deeply wounded. She goes on, on the other hand, there is a need for a new contract, a promise that the past will not be repeated. Who and what is restored? We believe that we needed to struggle to see that victims were restored, that offenders were restored, that communities were restored. Were they? Well, there was something said by one victim, a simple man who broke down as he described the way he had been tortured and lost the use of his legs. And when he came out and they asked him how he felt about it, he said, I think the nation is being washed by our tears. So, and he also said, the nation cried my tears with me today. A bridge too far? Did the TRC fail South Africa? Did South Africa fail the TRC? Well, let's look at our country 20 years later. The GDP of South Africa has tripled. Inflation. The white regime left us with 14% inflation, and it's down to below 6% today. Foreign reserves are up from 3 billion to 50 billion. Tax receipts, interestingly, were just 114 billion from 1.7 million people. Now 13.7 million of our people contribute. We're coming close to a trillion budget. 4.5 million more South Africans, that's 10% of our population, have graduated since 94 to the middle class. And then something which some would argue, of course, is, 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 is a negative. I regard it as a great positive. 2.4 million people received social grants, the, the terribly poor, and that's gone up to 16.1. 35% of our population receive social grants from the state in order to survive. Uh, that is in a country where unemployment has remained between 25 and 30 percent, with 50 percent of young people out of work. Just, I remember, I remember crying with joy when I heard Nelson Mandela make his first speech in Parliament. And he said, I don't know how we're going to do it, but he said, from today I announce that every nursing mother and every child under six will receive free medical treatment. Uh, and, of course, we are moving now towards a national health system in uh, South Africa. Our Gini index, however, is the highest in the world. We have not bridged the gap 
between the rich and the poor in our country. It's just that the rich have changed color somewhat and that there is a new extremely rich, uh, novo riche, if you like, black elite in our country. <coughs> Labor unrest is endemic and increasingly violent and crime is unacceptably high. Mm. And unfortunately, as the African National Congress regime in our country loses the vision of a rainbow nation, they are beginning to be willing to use identity politics and even tribal politics in order to hold on to power in certain parts of the country. So the future does not look good politically. And while young people mix very, very freely, we have four sons, they are in their 40s, and they live in a multiracial world. They live in a world where they move amongst their colleagues. And there's a new generation we call the born free generation, which is free of baggage. They really couldn't care less about what happened in the struggle. They just want to get on with their lives. And they get on together. A lot of intermarriage. Those issues are not issues with that generation. Of course, those with gray hair remain pretty segregated in the country. Are South Africans reconciled? It's a difficult question, this one. When I come here, people ask me to compare race relations in South Africa with race relations in America. And they say, is there a difference? And I say, yes, there is. And they say, well, what's the difference? And I say, well, we have them and you don't. <laughs> Now, we don't have good race relations. We have very abrasive race relations sometimes. But we have relations. It's not something under the table, as it is in this country. It's in your face. It's on the surface. And we talk about it from morning until night. We talk about it until the cows come home. And it seems as long as we talk about it, we won't kill each other about it. And so we keep on talking about it. We will not suggest that we have resolved race relations in South Africa. But we could not have that conversation had it not been for the sacrifice made by the people who served on the Truth Commission and even more the people who came and bared their souls at the Truth Commission. Particularly because, and this is where this is where I'm, I'm, I'm getting close to, to giving you my judgment on the, on the opening question. The Truth Commission did not fail South Africa. But South Africa has failed the Truth Commission. <coughs> That's my judgment. I don't, the Truth Commission certainly had its problems. But there have been no acts of revenge based on the past, anywhere in our country. Not a single torturer, not a single perpetrator of atrocities has, has walked down a dark alley and, and revenge has been visited upon him or her. It hasn't happened. It's almost as if the nation is too busy trying to learn how to get on together to bother with that kind of detail. So that is something for which we, we are deeply grateful. Uh, we're still one nation with four peaceful democratic elections behind us and <coughs> one coming up in May next year which I fear may not be as peaceful because the ANC is beginning to lose ground. And people who, who think that they have a right to occupy government uh, may find it difficult to, to have to give ground uh, when, when the elections begin to, to, to move against them. My problem with my country starts with me. You see, I think that when that two years came to an end, quite rightly, you couldn't go on forever with the Truth Commission. That is the time when civil society, and in particular, the churches of South Africa, because they are located in every single town and village and township 
and shantytown in South Africa should have picked up the process and localized it and said we've seen it on the national scale now let's come into our home villages I lived in a place in Johannesburg within sight of a town that used to be called Sophia Town where every single person of color was kicked out so that white Afrikaners could take over and change the name to Triumph could you be any more crude than that now it seemed to me that we needed a mini truth commission in Triumph and we needed to bring back the previous uh, population of Sophia Town and we needed to have conversation with one another and we needed to find each other somehow and I could multiply that a thousand times across the country if we had the will and if we had put aside everything else some did my successor as bishop in the area I served began to hold what he called services of memory and he invited people to just come into the church and tell their stories and I watched some of those happen and I remember one of my clergy who I'd had some trouble with and I could never work out why this talented young man seemed to have a sort of a fault line running through his ministry and then I saw him in a video at one of these services of, of memory and pain and memory and, and he, he came forward in front of this largely black audience and he was white and he said I was called up into the army as a young white and he said these are some of the things I did and he said at some point in order to just stay alive I stopped feeling <coughs> and I did these things without feeling and then he said the thing which explains so much about him to me he said I've never been able to feel again and he said I'm throwing myself on your mercy you're the people I did this to can you help me feel again and I remembered the healing of the leper and I remembered that perhaps the sign of healing was that he could feel pain again he said I want to feel pain please now those kind of things can only happen in local circumstances and we didn't do it and the reason we didn't do it I guess is we were just too damn tired after 40 years of struggle and I guess we thought we'd done enough but the message is you've never done enough not in the work of reconciliation nevertheless I think we may make it <laughs> Questions, any conversation, any reflections? Uh, Peter's glad. I'm happy to have feel any, any questions. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. I really did feel emotionally everything you were talking about. Um, my question, and I've asked a few of the South Africans I've met this, is with uh, Nelson Mandela coming close to the end of his life, yes. do you feel like him being such a symbol of um, peace and freedom? some violence may erupt after his death? No. You're the third I, person who said no to me. I beg your pardon? You're the third South African who right away said no. Yes, I, I don't think it's an issue. I think there'll be deep, deep grief. There'll be deep sadness. I think there is a sense that this, this is our father amongst particularly black South Africans, but not only black South Africans. And, uh, and so, yes, there will, be, there will be an outpouring of grief. Uh, but I do not believe there, there's a small group of extreme right-wing white radicals who are spreading this rumor that when Mandela goes that's when 
blacks will rise up and kill us. And it's sad that they are doing that, but they have not yet entered the new South Africa. They're a very small group. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Shalani. Thank yes. you so much for your wonderful speech. Um, I have too many questions. <laughs> this is so fascinating. One of my questions is, um, how strong has the state formation been? In other words, is there a political vacuum within which local people like clergy could really have a lot of powerful civil governance in, in their role as um, helping maybe construct a more unified national identity? Is that, is that the kind of thing that you see as a real possibility? And do, you know, in terms of the basis of social power, do you think that local clergy and, um, and local, you know, parishes like that might have some sort of legitimate power and, um, you know, maybe referent power where they could really help um, have, have the power to draw people forward a little bit and maybe using the contact hypothesis of reconciliation just bring groups together and help bridge these gaps that seem to be still just prevalent everywhere. What you describe is happening in small ways all over the country. It's not happening in an organized and really united way. The, uh, the, the powers that be in our country who have sort of slipped with each regime further down the scale of trust, <coughs> trust, trustworthiness and deeper into uh, the temptations of corruption and so on, uh, are afraid. They're very aware of, of the, the power. I don't like the word power, the influence of uh, particularly of the faith communities, which are now much more ecumenical and interfaith than they were in the struggle years, in a way. Uh, and, uh, and so I, I do believe that that potential exists. And uh, I have called right now, given my concerns about the possibilities of violence in this coming election, being cynically used by the ANC in particular, and particularly in the Cape province where they do not govern, and where they somehow feel they have a right to govern everywhere, uh, that we, we need to return to some of the lessons we learned in the National Peace Accord, where we dragged the fighting parties into one room and forced them to agree to codes of conduct so that they would conduct elections as grown-ups. And uh, it worked, uh, and it held back the violence in 1994. And I, I think something similar, perhaps not as intense, but something similar is needed now. Um, what has been missing has been significant leadership figures in, to, to compare with some of the church leaders we had in the anti-apartheid struggle. For some years, uh, as, as church leadership has moved quite rightly into black hands largely, I think many of my black colleagues who have come into leadership have struggled to face their black political <coughs> colleagues and to call them out on things they need to be called out on. It's almost as if we're letting our brothers down. They've got a tough job running the country and they're black like us. And that doesn't wash with me one little bit uh, because uh, that time is over. Uh, we are 20 years into democracy. We have seasoned politicians who we must hold accountable, uh, especially for corruption. And, and I think those leaders are emerging now. And we are hearing s stronger voices from the uh, faith communities ready to take on and, and, and feeling they can do so without being accused of, of aiding and abetting the sort of old enemy. You know what I mean? So, yes, I, I am hopeful that that will strengthen. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Pippa Pizwana, but I am facilitating the live stream, and we have a question from Dr. Susan Morrison, who has been um, watching the live stream, and she says, are there contemporary examples of restorative justice in South Africa? Yes, I think there are. Uh, I think that uh, Michael Lapsley, who is an Anglican priest whose arms, whose hands were blown off by a, a, a secret police bomb and who lost the sight of one eye, <coughs> continues to conduct workshops which bring together people who carry burdens of uh, resentment and who struggle with the past. 
And uh, th that continues to be a flag-bearing example of restorative justice. Uh, I, I, I think that in the actual justice system in South Africa itself, it's a little overwhelmed by the enormous crime problem that we have with massive poverty. Uh, and uh, I think the, the inspiring moments for me have been to see our constitutional court which is our equivalent of your Supreme Court, make rulings which have been consistently on the side of, of the little people of this world. Uh, so that in South Africa you cannot evict somebody from a property unless you are able to provide an alternative for that person. Now that's a massive ruling. How one uh, implements it is another story. But it, it, it's an indication of the desire to create a compassionate society where issues like that are resolved in a different way. I think young people who are not necessarily focused only, they don't zero only in on the narrow field, if you like, of, of national politics. But uh, I think young people are at work in all sorts of alliances and formations to improve uh, society. And because the country struggles with resources in some respects, there's a, a lot of inventiveness at a, a community level to bring people together, to ensure that education improves. Uh, people have given up to some degree on state education. Unfortunately, in our country, it has reached such a, an awful low. Uh, but instead of uh, going for an option of elitist private schools, there are movements to provide low-cost private education for, for people. Uh, which are very inventive indeed, and uh, and it's 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 our younger generations who are involved in things like that. Very encouraging, indeed. Yes. Um, one one hears when you go there that the South African Council of Churches is dead in the water, divided, and uh, the young people have are all going to mega churches and have deserted the denominations that mostly participated in the struggle. Now that's what one hears. Could you, could you reflect on that, please? Sadly, I think there is a lot of truth to that. The South African Council of Churches, in a sense, lost its raison d'etre uh, after, after the struggle. And I guess I would have to say leadership was not all that impressive either at that particular moment. Uh, and, and so uh, it, also, it also had the temerity to take on the new government over a couple of issues. Especially their love affair with Zimbabwe and Mugabe. Especially their corruption around the purchase of arms, the so-called arms deal, which wasted 60 billion rand of South African money that could have been used for the poor. And the South African Council of Churches took them on when perhaps it wasn't very strong. And, uh, and the, the state squashed it pretty hard at that moment. So it hasn't been a happy story. And uh, it is true that um, the, the so-called you know, mega churches with their individualism and their prosperity gospel seem to have taken a hold of a whole generation of, 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 of young black South Africans, for instance, which is the other side of the coin uh, of some of my excitement about the younger generation. And, and so 
Yeah, I, th I think that the, the churches that played the, the, the primary role in the struggle against the party have struggled to find their identity in the new South Africa for a period of time. I think we've passed through that now, and I think it's beginning to happen. There was somebody there, yes. Rod, Rod. You accorded a significant spiritual role to Desmond Tutu yes. in the liberation of the TRC and its success. And I'm wondering in this um, year when the World Council of Churches has emphasized the importance of reconciliation as a key ecumenical agenda item, um, to what extent one can say that um, the situation in Sri Lanka requires such spiritual leadership, albeit from a different religious perspective, and perhaps other areas in the world as well require similar spiritual leadership. Can that come from other religious traditions? In what way can it come, and is it required? Thank you for that, and I believe that that's such an important question. I, I believe certainly it can come from other religious traditions. Um, and. Uh, and I believe that uh, there are a number of places where what seems to be missing is significant leadership. I mean, the Palestinian-Israeli issue uh, was stopped dead in its tracks through the assassination of Rabin. Uh, we think now that it's an intractable issue. It was, a, it was being resolved because there were leaders on both sides at that moment who had the stature and the willingness to reach out towards Israel. <coughs> as happened in South Africa. And we had a lot to do with those leaders at that time because they came to, to discover how things had been done in, in, in South Africa. And so I, I don't want to put too much weight on individuals, but it seems to me that in every apparently intractable situation, it is very helpful to have people who can put into words both the aspirations and the fears of those who are trying to find one another and who are trusted to represent those aspirations and those fears as they reach out to one another. And that is what happened in South Africa. Uh, so such leadership, whether it comes from religious or other uh, sources, uh, is, is, is part of the healing. Of, of broken situations. We had the elders with us just a couple of weeks ago in Cape Town. Now, you may not have heard of the elders. They, they work under the radar. They are uh, largely uh, Nobel Peace Laureates. Uh, they are other people who have, people like Kofi Annan, people like Mary Robertson, uh, people like uh, Marty Atisari, Desmond Tutu, uh, and of course this group was brought together initially by Nelson Mandela. And uh, that group are working all the time in some of the most difficult situations on this planet, uh, but doing so in the background, quietly, using their influence as peacemakers. And uh, I was very impressed to, to see them and to hear them and to realize that, that people of this stature, Jimmy Carter, of course, is one of them, uh, are playing a role. Yes? Um, you mentioned that when the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was established that South Africans looked to places in Central America and South America where there had been yes. similar efforts. And one of those places I know a bit about is Chile, and yes. I noticed a number of parallels between what you described in the Chilean experience, including some of the lingering problems. Has there been any effort to reach out to those other places where reconciliation commissions have taken place to sort of compare notes? Oh, absolutely. The vice chair of our Truth Commission, Dr. Alex Borain, established the Institute for Transitional Justice, which is based in New York, and he led that institute for a number of years and was a consultant in uh, repeatedly around the world uh, in places like Kosovo and, you know, Serbia and all over the world. Where we, what we, what we learned from the Chileans was one thing, but we, we were troubled by the fact that individual accountability was, was not part of the equation. 
that units of the military and so on were held accountable, but not individuals. And we felt that individual accountability was crucial. Yeah. One of the design problems, you know, I missed a slide, I want to say, and I got, I'm not going to look for it now. <laughs> but I, missed, I missed a slide which indicated some of the frailties of the Truth Commission. And let me just point out one of them, which we just didn't see. It's a design fault. Okay? And when you look back on it, you wonder how on earth you let that happen. It was this. It was a matter of timing. When a perpetrator appeared before the amnesty committee, and if the perpetrator's uh, admission, disclosure, met the conditions, the amnesty committee declared that that person had amnesty. And that same day, he or she walked out with amnesty. When a victim spoke about their suffering, the Reparations and Rehabilitation Committee had to discuss the principle of rehabilitation and re reparations. And then it had, to make, it had to make proposals to Parliament. And Parliament had to debate whether it had the money to make these reparations. And years later, Parliament came out with a paltry 30,000 rand, $3,000, for each of the victims. A disgrace. Now that is, the timing was a dreadful mistake and did create some very real resentment. But what was worse was that by the time it came to Parliament, Mandela was gone, Mbeki was the president, Mbeki had lived in London or wherever for 30 years in exile. He had not felt the heat and the burden of the day in South Africa. And many of the people who were exiles like him had no empathy whatever <coughs> with the sufferers who had carried the burden of apartheid. And therefore, the political will and the moral will was no longer there. And I'm ashamed of that, and the Becky should be ashamed of it as well. There's one other question from uh, the live streaming. Samantha Ball says, you mentioned that race relations do not happen in the U.S. Do you think something like the TRC would help in the U.S. context, even with very different political situations? I think that's a very good question. I was privileged to be part of the first and only Truth Commission that has taken place in this country, and that is the Greensboro Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I was part of the designing of that and I was privileged to be part of the conversations that set it up. A very small event happened a long time ago which hurt a lot of people in that city and cast a shadow over that city, Greensboro, North Carolina. And they had the courage to revisit that event and to try and help people process it 20 or so years later. I believe that events like that in different parts of the United States, which is such a big country that a national event, I think, would be uh, unrealistic. But for the revisiting of places where deep hurt and brokenness were caused uh, to one another by, by people in this country, uh, could, only, uh, could only increase the health of this society. When I move around, especially in the south, but not only in the south of this country, I do sense that I'm walking on contaminated ground where there's toxic waste buried and it keeps on coming to the surface and it keeps on poisoning the atmosphere. And I think some digging is not a bad thing to do and some honest facing of what happened in the past in local communities. Thank you so much, not only for today, but for all that you do. Uh, and my question has to do with what really is a moment, maybe, 20 years later. Uh, it, much of the story you tell is one of uh, mixed results. Does the 20th anniversary offer South Africa an opportunity to revisit, uh, renew the dedication, uh, try to deal with uh, the risk of having toxic waste buried for a century as we have lived. Um, is there an opportunity, and if so, what kind of leadership or grassroots work could make a difference? 
I pray that when the 20th anniversary comes, the victorious party political speeches of the party in power will be drowned out by a much deeper, stronger, moral cry. Uh, what has happened to our dream? What has happened to the rainbow people of God? What has happened to the, the dream of a new South Africa? Why have we allowed our politicians to suck us down into mediocrity when the world was looking at us for inspiration? And that is the word that needs to come, I think, from uh, spiritual leaders, it needs to come from a civil society, it needs to come from every person who, who loves that country and believes that we have a responsibility to the wider world. And uh, if necessary, we need to shame our politicians into returning. This is the cry of Mampella Rompella, who is trying to launch a new political movement I don't know how successful she will be, but every time she speaks, she reminds us that we are meant to be bigger than we are. And we are meant to have a better, uh, a, a better uh, imagination than we have allowed ourselves uh, in these last years to slip into. So it's a good question, I guess, to end the evening on. Uh, it's a challenge to me. And you are asking me, what am I going to do about the 20th anniversary of freedom? Uh, I accept. I accept the the weight of that challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I do want to recognize, since we read this book. Uh, in our classes, Between Vengeance and Forgiveness, that the author of this book just asked a question. Yeah. And we're very grateful to have you doing that. <laughs> Thank you again. It's been a wonderful evening. Now, the good news is you get to Act 2 tomorrow because Peter is preaching in chapel at 11 o'clock. And, uh, and then it's going to be part of... Uh, practicing of faith and doing and is going to do an oral history in that class with uh, Mary Elizabeth leading that. So thank you for all of this. It's wonderful for you to be with us and thank you all for coming.